Now, let me get to what's on my heart today. In uh, 2009, the uh, book hit the marketplace in America called Heaven is for Real. And uh, many of you probably read the book. You know, I travel every week across America, and because I travel and speak typically on the subject of Bible prophecy, I'm always asked by people when I go into churches, well, have you read this book? Or what do you think about this? And so forth and so on. So I kind of make it my business to try to stay up with what's going on, you know, in the world of Christendom and the books that are out and especially those things that seem to gain popularity. And this book just kind of exploded onto the market and uh, captured the hearts and minds of people all across America. I mean, think about this, a little boy, Colton Burpo, and he talks about this fact that he had actually, quote unquote, been to heaven in the presence of God. Well, I read the book because I was asked about it. In fact, I read it twice. And I thought it was an interesting sort of a read. And then the movie came out in 2013. And so once again, my wife and I went and we watched the movie. But as we walked out of the theater, I turned to Sandra and I said, honey, I got to write a book about this because there's an underlying message in that entire movie, more so in the movie than in the book. But the underlying subliminal type message that was communicated is that when every person dies, they all go to heaven. And I'm here to tell you this morning, that is not what the Bible teaches. And so I'm going to do something different this morning, something maybe that might uh, make you a little bit uncomfortable, I'm not trying to do it intentionally, but we're going to talk about something today that's typically not spoken of in churches across the country, at least for the last 30 or 40 or 50 years even. We're going to actually talk about hell because I went home and began to write a book with the encouragement not only of my wife and the Holy Spirit, but my publisher as well. And we titled the book, Hell is for Real why it matters. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front what we're going to talk about and why it does matter. It matters because 300 people in America die every 60 minutes of every day. In the hour that we'll spend here together, 300 people will step into eternity. That's five people every single moment just in America that die. Now, with that in mind, why is it that we never really hear anything much about what happens to a person when they die? unless it happens to be at a funeral service. And even then, most of the time, we see or hear some preacher doing his very, very best to preach a person into heaven. When was the last time that you were at a funeral service and the preacher stood up and he said, in this box is, is, uh, is John Doe, and I want you to know that John died and went to hell. You ever heard that in a funeral, at a funeral service? Well, you haven't. And the reason you haven't is because, you know, we preachers, we lie. That's it. We just lie. Now, now don't, don't judge us too harshly, okay? I, I want to tell you that we do it because, you know, Paul writes about to the degree that we've been comforted by God, to that degree we want to comfort others also. And so we have this desire during this difficult time in, in a family's life to want to, you know, be comforting to them. And so what we do is we lie. And we say things like, well, you know, he was a wonderful person. He was a, uh, he, he, he was a member of the Rotary Club and he donated this, he donated that. Oh, and he, was a, he got baptized uh, at, a, at, at a church 35, 40 years ago. He hasn't been in church since then, but he's 35, 40 years ago. He got baptized at a church. He really was a pretty good person. You probably heard about the funeral service where the preacher was up there waxing eloquent about this particular individual in the box to the point that the wife who was sitting on the front row, nudged her son and said, go up there and look, I think we're in the wrong service. <laughs> he can't be talking about your father. <laughs> now, you know, that's humorous and, and we can laugh about those things, but listen, preachers perjure themselves regularly because we have a desire to wanna to comfort people. Now, here's the, here's the problem with that. The problem is, is that Jesus himself tells us in Matthew chapter seven, verse 13 and 14, when he talks about enter in at the narrow gate, for broad is the gate, wide is the road that leads to destruction and many or most go that way. 
But narrow is the road that leads to eternal life and few there are that find it. Now, here's Jesus in his public ministry. It may shock you to hear me say this, but Jesus talked more about hell and judgment than he did any other subject in the Bible with the exception of salvation. Did you know that? Most people are kind of surprised. Listen, there are 1,850 verses in scripture that if you happen to have a Bible that's a red letter edition, these are the words in red. Now, they're the reason they're in red is because it's something in the Latin called ipsissimus verba, which means these are not what the disciples thought Jesus said. It's not what they wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These were the actual verbatim words that came out of the mouth of Jesus, recorded precisely and preserved. And of that 1,000, 850 verses when Jesus talked about hell that's more than as I said anything else except heaven 13% of everything Jesus talked about was hell and judgment now if it was so important for God in the flesh to talk about what happens when a person dies about eternity then why is it that we tend to ignore it in the body of Christ well I want to tell you why just recently by the way it's a great question you ask why George Barna, who we're grateful for, they do a lot of surveys. You may have heard of the Barna group. And recently, the Barna folks released a survey where they interviewed 1,048 pastors across the country, mostly from evangelical churches. And of that 1,048 pastors that they surveyed, they asked this question, do you believe the Bible addresses the social issues of our day? Now, at the root of this were things such as, you know, homosexual or gay marriage, things such as abortion and so forth. That's kind of what they're asking. Social issues of our day, anarchy in our streets and so forth and so on. Now, interestingly, of the 1,048 pastors surveyed, 97% said in their response that they believe the Bible addresses those social issues of our day. And yet the second question was this, if you believe the Bible addresses those social issues of our day, do you teach your people what the Bible says about those things? Now, this may or may not surprise you. It somewhat shocked me. But upwards of the same percentage, about 97% said no, they don't do that. Now, when asked then why you don't do it, they boiled it down to this, that the reason that preachers and churches today don't talk about these taboo, if I may use that term, subjects anymore primarily is because it goes to the definition of ministerial success. In other words, how do you define a successful ministry? And so preachers want to have a quote unquote successful ministry. So they came up with, as a result of all these answers, that there are five main criteria that pastors use today, ministers use, to measure a successful ministry. Here they are. Number one, you may have guessed it, the number of people in attendance. Number two, you probably guessed this as well, the amount of money they give. Number three, the number of programs they offer to their membership. Number four, how many staff members are there on staff? And number five, how many square feet do we have in our facility? Now folks, that, I, I don't know if that bothers you as much as it bothers me, but I gotta tell you, that's a gut-wrenching survey in my humble opinion, that we would measure our faithfulness to God and to the service to the kingdom of God in those ways. If that's true, then we can say that the great missionaries that have gone before us, people like J. Hudson Taylor, William Carey, the list goes on and on and on, that all of those men and women of God were abject failures according, if this is the standard. So what we've decided to do in churches today is just stay away from those subjects because after all, we really don't want to say or do anything that in any way might offend anyone for over anything because if we do, they might not come back and then that would hurt our attendance. So today, I'm gonna gamble. I'm gonna roll the dice. I'm really not a gambler, but I've never rolled dice in my life, but I'm a, I've heard the term. Some of you know all about it, I can see. Having said that, I'm going to gamble a little bit and say this. Since I'm a guest and I'm leaving after today, <laughs> I'm going to be bold. Frankly, I, I really don't know how to be any other way. But I want to say something to you that you may, not, may or may not have heard before. 
And that is this. I'm looking out across this congregation this morning. And as I look out across the room, I'm keenly aware of several things. And that is that first of all, within days or weeks or months, there will be someone in this room who will step from this life into eternity. I can tell you as a former pastor, I've preached funeral services for babies. I've preached them for young kids, five, six, seven years old, teenagers, and everything else, as well as the older folks. When I first went to New Orleans to pastor in 1980, the very first week I was there, an elderly member of our church passed away and I went to do the funeral service and had the privilege between the funeral home and the burial site of leading the funeral director to Christ in the car. From that time on, for the next five years, every time there was a family who didn't have a pastor or a minister, they were not faithful in church, maybe they had been excommunicated from the Catholic church for whatever reason, the priest wouldn't do a service, they called me. And I literally did bunches of funeral services. And I will tell you that as I've watched people through the years, I've come to agree with an assessment made a number of years ago when someone said this, most people today live lives of quiet desperation. The truth of the matter is, is that I am a people watcher and when I watch people and talk to people as I often do, I find that so many people today are still searching for and they're looking for answers to these very basic questions of life. You know, sometimes we think it's just the, the young kids or the teenagers or the college students and so forth that, that are looking for answers and yet the truth is I find elderly people, they're still searching for the same answers. The truth of the matter is, is they're asking questions like, where did I come from? Why was I born? What is life really all about? How do I find happiness? When and how am I going to die? And what will happen to me when I die? And I, I see this kind of anxiety. No one ever really talks about it. It's kind of just right there under the very surface. And so many people have these questions and they're going about to and fro with this sense of anxiety, as I said a moment, this quiet desperation, trying to find an answer to these basic questions of life and they still come up empty because most of the time they're looking in the wrong place. And yet God speaks to this. God addresses these issues. God wants us to know. L let me tell you what I know is gonna happen at some point in time in the future. I can tell you about your future. I can tell you about mine. You see, either Jesus is going to come when that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ are raised and we who are alive and remain are going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air and then we're going to be taken away to the Father's house. And there's going to be people who are going to be a part of that. In fact, I'm planning on that because I think God is leaning out of heaven right now screaming to get our attention that soon he's going to come. But until he does and unless he does, I want to tell you that every person within the sound of my voice has a divine appointment. One day, you will step from this life out of the physical world and into the spiritual world, but do not be mistaken, you will not die. You see, God created us to live forever, and you and I will live forever. And we will either live in the very presence of God for all of eternity as he remodels and, and uh uh, brings us back here to reign and rule upon this earth for a thousand years and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth and all of eternity will be before us. And by the way, we're not going to be those of us who are going to heaven. We're not going to float around a cloud. We're not going to strum a harp. Just because you go to heaven, you're not going to get instantly musically inclined. <laughs> if you're like me, the only thing I can play is really, truthfully, is the radio or my iPad or my iPhone, whatever the case may be. I can't sing, can't play, but we're not going to be doing that. We're going to be doing things. Heaven is a place of sound activity. We're going to be busy. So get over that cloud thing because it's, that's, that's Hollywood. That's fairy tale stuff. But there's another group of people that are not going to spend eternity in heaven. They're going to be separated from God in this place called hell. And coincidentally, Jesus said there will be more of them there than there. 
He says the majority will die. Listen, we've been commissioned to go into all the world and to make disciples, and we're going to, be keep, we're going to keep on doing that and trying to do that until the day that Jesus calls us home. But I want to break some earth-shattering news to you. We're not going to win the world to Jesus. Because God said most people will not come this way. Most people will not humble themselves, turn from their sin, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and him and him alone for their salvation. But rather they will attempt to earn standing before God or they will just blatantly say, I don't need you. I'm going to be the captain of my own ship. I'm going to do what I want to do and you can take it or leave it. And God will always, 100% of the time, he'll leave it. So let's talk about this matter of hell a little bit. Because you see, today we're being told by people like Rob Bell, for example, a minister who, is, who Oprah has popularized lately. And uh, Rob says, there is no hell. That this earth, that this life we're living right now, this is all the hell that you're ever going to experience. He's sadly mistaken. I don't know where he gets his information, but he certainly didn't get it from the word of God. Amen. But in addition to that, we have people today telling us about the fact that uh, annihilationism is the thing. Because when you die, you just simply are, poom, that's it. You're gone. That's all there is. You cease to exist. Along with that is this idea of something called conditional immortality, which is pretty much the same idea as annihilation. And these are the popular things along the way that, that people are coming to us and they're telling us, and let me tell you the tragedy, the closer we get to the coming of Jesus, the greater the intensity of deception occurs to the point today that Satan, and if I were the devil, I would do exactly what he's doing because he is the father of lies and deception. I would try to convince every person alive that they needn't be concerned about eternity, that there'll never be a day of reckoning, there'll never be a day of judgment and they can do anything that they want to do and that when this life is over that's it and by the way we're seeing in the streets of America the result of what happens when you teach the religion of evolution and you teach people that there will never be a day of judgment that's why we have anarchy in the streets of America that's why when people say to me well you know I'm, I'd love to go to the Holy Land but I'm afraid to go because I think it's dangerous listen don't come to Dallas Texas because even the police department gets attacked. But think about the anarchy we've seen in Baltimore, Cleveland, and so forth, Ferguson, Missouri, on and on we could go. Where does that come from? From the idea that there'll never be a day of reckoning. That's not what the Bible teaches. So what, in fact, does the Bible teach? Well, Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Every person is going to have a day of reckoning. Now, for the believer... I prefer not to use the word judgment because the, the Greek text actually is the idea of evaluation. You see, if you're a believer today and you by faith have trusted Christ, then you've been saved by grace. Not according to your works, as you well know, but by his mercy he saved us. It's all about him and not about you. But when we are washed in the blood of the lamb, when the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell within us, we have been forgiven. We're not perfect. We've been forgiven. We've been cleansed. And now we stand before the throne of God, not in our own righteousness, but clothed in his righteousness. You understand that? So the day comes when a believer dies. What happens to a believer? We're instantly, as Paul says, absent from the body and present with the Lord. Paul said, for I'm willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But more importantly, we're taken to the Father's house. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, because on the cross, Jesus hung there and one thief believed in him. And he said, this day, you will be with me in paradise. Now, quickly listen to this. Where's paradise? Well, you see the Bible, and you're gonna see this in just a moment. The Bible talks about a place called hell. But you need to realize today that in the time of Jesus and in the Old Testament, hell uh, was actually not called that, but rather there was a place called Sheol. And Sheol was the realm of the dead. You see, when it says that Abraham departed and, was, and went to be with his fathers, he went to Sheol. Now, Sheol had two compartments. The upper compartment was called paradise. This is where those people went who were looking forward to the promises of God. They believed God, and as Abraham said, and it was accounted to him or credited unto, unto him as righteousness. Those Old Testament saints, they were in paradise. The people who were not there those who had not looked forward to God, those wicked, rebellious individuals, they were in a place, 
in a lower part of Sheol called Hades. And so Hades is the realm of the dead. So here's what happens. The believer in Jesus' time went to paradise when they died. The unbeliever went to Hades. But when the resurrection took place and when Jesus came forth from the grave, Jesus emptied out paradise and he took all of those folks to the Father's house to be with him where one day when he comes and claims his bride, all of us will be taken to the Father's house. Jesus has said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, that you may be also. So we're there with the Father. But the unsaved are still down here. They're still in Hades. And one day they will leave Hades because they will then be called to appear at an event in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, that we call the great white throne judgment of God. And the Bible says then that, listen, that Hades or hell will give up its dead, that all of lost humanity will stand before God. You see, the believer is up there. We get rewarded at this evaluation time called the judgment seat of Christ. We get rewarded based on the things that we've done with the right motive, the right spirit and so forth. We receive our crowns from the Lord from those good things that we've done and so forth in service to the kingdom because while we're saved by grace, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works as Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 says. And so we get rewarded, but the unbeliever stays here in this place of suffering until the great white throne judgment. And the Bible says, and the books of life will be opened. And every person standing there will be judged, and this is the key word, according to what they have done. So in other words, in life, you only have two choices. You can either trust what Christ did on the cross, or you can somehow try it, whereby you then get entrance into the presence of God by the blood of the lamb, or you can do your best down here trying to gain a right relationship with God, which simply cannot be accomplished. But having said that, let's back this up a little bit. And so I want you to take your Bible and oh, coincidentally, that's why purgatory is not a biblical teaching. No one can move a person from Hades or paradise anywhere. That's not, that's impossible. And as I said, there's no such thing as a body just sleeping because you see the spirit is alive either in heaven or separated from God. And yes, there will be a bodily resurrection one day. Yes, the Bible's very clear about that. When Jesus comes, the body will be transformed and changed. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 56 and so forth. But let's focus right now, if we may, on what happens to an unbeliever when they die. And so with that in mind, I want you to look at the most extensive teaching in all of Scripture. It's found in Luke chapter 16. You may have wondered if I was ever going to get here, but I am. I've arrived. Luke chapter 16. Remember, of all the things that Jesus said, for example, he said in Matthew that Gehenna, the valley there in Jerusalem on the south uh, uh, eastern side of the city, that that valley was the place where the worm never dies, the fire never is quenched. He said, that was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. And, and when Jesus walked by, he said, this is what hell is like. It's a place of torture and suffering and so forth. Someone asked Billy Graham one time, they said, Dr. Graham, do you really believe in a literal hell? It really is, there's really fire? And Dr. Graham said it this way. He said, if the Bible uses a metaphor to describe something and talks about it being fire, the reality is even is worse than the metaphor that is used. And so the answer to that question is, he said, yes, I believe that. Now, folks, I want to tell you this morning what I'm about to share with you, the rest of this message. I want you to know it's not rated PC for political correctness because I don't give a rip about that. It's also not rated T for tolerance because I don't really care much about that either. It is certainly not rated WF for warm and fuzzy. You'll have to get that somewhere else. But I will tell you that in these next few moments, I'm going to share something with you that's rated BT, and that's biblical truth. And I want to tell you why I'm going to tell you this. I'm not trying to make you mad today. I'm not trying to offend you in any way. I'm trying to tell you something because what kind of a man of God would I be to stand before you today knowing full well that if Jesus tarries, every person within the sound of my voice is going to die and step into eternity. And I want to make sure that you realize one thing, and that is eternity is too long for you to be wrong. You can't afford to do that. I don't even know you, 
But because Jesus died for you, he established value on you. And I can tell you that I love you because he loves you. And I don't have to know you to love you. By the way, I'm looking out there at some of you. And I'm not sure. But anyway. <laughs> but the truth is, this is a serious moment. And here's why. Because one day, you'll be in the box. You'll have your turn in the box. And some preacher will stand up and talk about you. I was leaving Fort Myers, Florida about four years ago. Turned on to I-75 going north. Center and I have kind of become snowbirds. Even though in Texas it doesn't get that bad in the winter, but nevertheless. So I'm driving up I-75 and here's a huge billboard on the east side of the freeway going north. And here's what it said, and I quote, Live your life in such a way that the preacher doesn't have to lie at your funeral. So that's my desire for you today. By the time this message is over, my prayer is, is that you will know that you know that you know him. That your family will be able to give a powerful, positive testimony about your living faith in Christ when that time comes. And you won't hear the things that I've heard when I sit with the family and they say, well, you know, well, when he was 15 or so, he, he was at a revival service and he walked down that aisle um, you know, and, but no, he hasn't been in church in years and, and, and no, he doesn't really care about God and no, his favorite words are some things that I can't repeat here and, and, and most of his time is spent at the country club with the guys smoking cigars and playing uh, cards and his church is really the church of the greens and fairways and he's faithfully never misses them a service on Sunday. Uh, see, I don't want anyone to have that conversation about you. I want somebody to stand up and say, man, listen, they lived for Jesus. He was the center of their life. They were dedicated. They were committed. His favorite book was the word of God. Just look at his Bible. His Bible tells you everything about him or her. That's the kind of testimony I want to hear. And I will tell you that it's fun. Now, you may think that's strange. It's fun. Maybe not the best word. It's a joy to be able to preach a funeral service for a person who's lived for Christ. When I can stand up and say, listen, you all know John Doe here. You know he had a commitment of, to, of his life to Jesus Christ and, and he's with the Lord and we're, they're celebrating in heaven and we're celebrating here today because of that faith. It's tough doing a funeral service for those who are not. In fact, I never talk about the person in the box when I don't know them about their faith. I just simply say, those of you who knew him and loved him or her, you know the life that they live. But I will tell you what this person would say if they could rise up out of the box and talk to us today. Here's what they'd say. They'd say, preacher, don't spend your time talking about me. Tell them about the reality of heaven and about the reality of hell. So that's what Jesus did. Luke chapter 16 is our text. And here's what the word of God says, beginning in chapter 19, there was a rich man. You're familiar with this, I'm sure. There was a rich man dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Now here's a guy who in Jesus' time, fine linen, purple is a symbol of wealth. This is the Armani suit, okay? This is the guy who's decked out. And at his gate, was laid a beggar named Lazarus. And if you had a gate, by the way, only wealthy people had gates, okay? So here's, he's rich, and at that gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, and not to be confused with the Lazarus of John chapter 11. All right, this is not Mary and Martha's brother. This is someone else named Lazarus. Covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Here was a guy who was materially, culturally speaking, in very big trouble. He didn't have a thing. Somebody brought him there. Apparently, he was somehow impaired. They seemed to put him at the gate, or, or rather, he may have chosen to hang out there because that's where the traffic flow was the best, perhaps. But whatever the case was, he was there. He was a beggar. He was one of those untouchables, if you please, one of those people, that, one of those people in society that you prefer not to even look at. And he's longing for something to eat. He's waiting for a handout. And the Bible says this, even the dogs came and licked his sores. It seems that the animals were even more concerned about the poor guy than the rich man was or anyone else. Well, verse 22 says, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. Okay, to paradise. 
And then it goes on to say, or Abraham sighed, then it goes on to say, the rich man also died and was buried. Now, I want you to look at verse 23. In hell, and if your Bible says hell, I want you to circle it and in the margin, just write Hades so that you can be clear about this. Because you see, hell is the lake of burning fire, sulfur, where Satan will be cast, where the antichrist, where the false prophet will be cast, and for all of the unsaved, they're in Revelation 20. So in hell, where he was in torment, or in Hades, where in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called him, Father Abraham, have pity upon me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things. Now notice it, there's no soul sleeping here. There's no unconsciousness. There's no annihilationism. Remember in your lifetime, in that short span, our lives are but a vapor. Here one moment, gone the next. In that short span, that little dash mark between the time, the year you were born and the date that you died. In that little span called life, he said, you had all of your good things. But he says, dip your finger, dip Lazarus' finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in this fire. Son, remember in your lifetime that you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us and you, a great chasm or a gulf has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, that is the rich man. Then I beg you, Father Lazarus, or father rather, send Lazarus to my father's house for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, the rich man argues, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophet, they'll not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Do I believe in all of the books that I'm reading these days about people who go to heaven? I don't know what happened to little Col Colton Burpo, but I'm just gonna tell you I have a real problem biblically with much of what I'm hearing about all these people who have gone to heaven partly because when they talk, they talk about people that they see and experiences they've had and so forth and so on. And the truth of the matter is, if you ever find yourself in the presence of Jesus, you'll not be talking about anything but him, period. Amen. Because that's all that matters. So I'm not gonna counter some of those things and I'm not attacking this sweet little boy nor his dad. But I'm just simply saying, we need to believe what we believe based on this book and not a book that someone else writes about something about this book. Does that, make, that probably didn't come out just right, but you get the point, don't you? Do your head like this. You got that. Okay. Now, I want to give you three things real quick about this passage of Scripture because I want you to leave here today with a complete understanding. Here they are. Number one, we're told in Scripture that this rich man was first of all in a place of suffering. Look at verse 23. The Bible uses the term hell, torment. The Bible uses the verse in verses 24 and 25, agony. In verse 28, torment again. So what we find is, is that here's this rich man who is now separated from God in this place and he is in agony, he's suffering, he's being tormented. And the word fire is used there. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water, the tip of his, so that it might relieve me from this fire that I'm in. Have you ever been burned? All of us, I think, at some point in time have stuck our finger to the hot stove, have we not? When we were a little child, duh, we've all done it. And it hurts. But can you imagine being like a man that I talked to several years ago who was burned in over 97% of his body? And he would tell you that there's nothing in the world more excruciatingly painful than that type of situation when the body is consumed with fire. I cannot imagine what that is like. When every, think about this, every nerve ending in your body is screaming with agony and pain. You need to understand that when a person dies without Christ, please get this today. The reason 
church folks today are so reluctant to share their faith, to talk to anyone about Christ. They, they think that they have to be perfect, which they don't. But the main reason is Satan is selling us a bill of goods, and that is that we don't really believe that when a person dies without Jesus, they do go to hell and they're suffering. Because if you saw that in your mind's eye, and we really believe that as a body of Christ, we wouldn't be so timid and bashful in sharing that Jesus Christ is the only way. Think about it. Satan's busy trying to lie to us and convince us, though they look good. I mean, hey, they're members of the club. They made a lot of money. Listen, the rich man died and in hell he was suffering. Make no mistake about it. There's agony in that place. But there's more. Secondly, there's separation. Because I want you to notice what it says in verse 26. Notice this. Jesus himself says, and besides all of this, there is a chasm, a gulf, separated. Now think about it. Do you realize that when a person dies, a lost person dies, everything that they care about, they're separated from. You understand, you bring nothing into this world, you will take nothing out of the world. And that's why John writes to us in 1 John chapter 2, do not love the things of the world. Why? Because they're temporary. They're not going to be around. You're not going to take them anywhere. But the bottom line is people get attached to stuff and they get attached to their homes and their families and their jobs and their recreation, all these kinds of things. Do you realize that if Jesus tarries, somebody else will probably live in your house? And do you realize that your kids will take all your money and blow it for the most part? That is, unless you're wise... Like Mark over there, he says, they're not getting mine. I'm spending it before I go. (laughs) But the truth is, think about this. Somebody else may drive your car. Somebody will mow your grass. I mean, all of this stuff, you'll be separated from all of that. Your identity, you think, well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I used to be, you know, I was president of the bank. I was this, I was that. What, y- your identity is wrapped up in who you are. You're going to be separated from that. Why? Because the ground's level at the foot of the cross. You're just a sinner in God's eyes. Separated. I talked to a man, and you may have heard this, but I'm an avid golfer. You can probably tell because I've got sunglass lines right here. It's not because I have a bad haircut. It's, it's what those are. But I talked to a man a few years ago, and he said, I'll tell you what, preacher. I'm tired of you trying to talk to me about Jesus stuff. Let me just get this clear. He said, when I die, I'm going to hell, and me and my buddies, we're going to have a big party there. We're going to be drinking, bud, and blah, blah, blah. I looked at him and said, you're a fool. Because that's not, you don't understand. Hell is a place of separation. You're not going to see your buddies. You're going to be all alone. There aren't any parties in hell. And by the way, the devil is not your friend. You may think that he's your buddy. He hates you, and because he's going to an eternal separation from God, he wants you to be in the same place where he's going to be suffering just like he's going to be suffering. So don't get the idea heaven is going to be a place where you're going to see your friends, or there's going to be some kind of camaraderie there. It's not. But third thing I want to simply say is this. Look at verse 27. It's a place of sorrow. And this is, I think, the hardest part for me to grasp. Because here's what it says. This rich man said, I beg you, Father. Now get the focus here. I'm begging you. I'm not asking. I am begging you to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. You see, this rich man was lost, and he didn't know it. He died and he couldn't help it and he went to hell and he couldn't change it. But he wanted something better for his brothers. You see, again, no annihilationism, no unconsciousness, a complete awareness of the fact that in my lifetime I had five brothers. I don't want them to suffer in in the way that I am. So send Lazarus to warn them so that they will not come to this place. And look at the word that he uses, this place of torment. I can't emphasize this enough. The suffering, the separation, the sorrow. But Abraham responded and said, no, they have Moses and the prophet. Let them listen to them. Abraham didn't say, no, they have a book called Heaven is for Real. Read that. 
He said, no, they have the prophets. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. If they don't listen to them, then they won't even believe if someone from the dead goes to them. They still won't repent. Tragically, most people end up dying without Christ. So I'm going to close by saying this. Abraham says that, or rather the rich man says, that if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Now I know that you have an idea in your mind of what it means to repent. But let me close this message today by saying, repentance is not regret. You see, there are a lot of people in the world who have regrets about choices they've made. And coincidentally, the wonderful part about this is God never sends anyone to hell. And God actually never sends anyone to heaven. He created us with a free will and we get to choose. So the choice is up to us. But you see, repentance is not regret. Even though we may have made many bad choices, we regret those choices. Because you see, in Mark chapter 10, there was a young rich man who came to Jesus and he told him about all the things he had done and so forth. And Jesus said, there's one more thing you need to do. Go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. And the Bible says, and he went away sorrowful. The word there is regret. He went away regretful. But it did not regret, it's not repentance. Secondly, repentance is not remorse. Because you see, in Matthew 27, Pilate, after he condemned Jesus, went and washed his hands. And he said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. He was remorseful that he had condemned Jesus, but that's not repentance. That's not turning to Christ in saving faith. Repentance is not reformation. You see, Judas, again, in Matthew chapter 27, took the 30 pieces of silver and he threw it into the temple. And he actually had a moment of reformation, but that's not repentance either. So what is repentance? Repentance is the prodigal son who was far away from his father and the Bible says, and he came to himself. And when he did, he went to the Father. Repentance is not being a member of a church. Repentance is not being a good person. Repentance is not striving to do the right things, nor is it giving money or anything else. Repentance is when you and I come to understand that Jesus paid it all on the cross and there's not one single thing that we can do to add to what Christ did and therefore repentance is humbly agreeing with God that we're separated from him by our sin nature and though therefore we can't save ourselves, we throw ourselves and cast ourselves at the mercy of Jesus Christ and we say, God with all that is within me, I agree with you that I'm separated from you by my sin, I commit myself to you. I want to turn from my sin. I want to turn to you in saving faith. I want you to come into my life and save me, forgive me and change me and give me the courage to live every day for you. That's repentance. And then it's fleshed out in our lives so that when the time comes in the box, somebody will stand up and say, I can testify with absolute certainty that this person is in the presence of God not because they were a church member, not because they were a good person, but because they gave their life to Christ and there was enough evidence in their life that if they were arrested for being a Christian, they would be convicted. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, this morning as the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro across this room, we're mindful today that life is but a vapor. And God, the days go by so quickly. It seems as though it was yesterday and yet it was years ago. And with each passing day, it seems to pick up speed. And as we begin to ponder the reality of our mortality today, I pray that there would not be a single individual in this room who does not know that they know that they know that you are the savior of their soul, the Lord of their life. And God, today I pray that there would be enough evidence in all of our lives that would give validity to the fact that we know you, 
that we've encountered you. You've changed our life. And for that one that does not know you today, God, I pray that today that they would grasp the reality, not through fear, but that they would come to understand the joy of knowing you, the joy of being clean before Christ, the joy of knowing that while we're not perfect, we're forgiven. So God, do your work as only you can do through the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. In the name of Jesus, by the authority that we've been given by you, we bind the enemy away from this place that lies, that, 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 that deception, that confusion would have no place in this room in these next few moments. And that Jesus, you would be lifted up. And the promise we claim today is that, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. Do what only you can do for your glory in Jesus' name.